Bibles to Matthew chapter 4, please. Matthew chapter 4. And I've been sitting on a word for a long time. This is something that the Lord... I knew that someday I'd written it down. It's, I, have, uh, I have notes upon notes in here of things that... Messages, things that the Lord has revealed to me. By the way, I, I just want to advocate again. I love a physical Bible in place of a Bible app. Um, and I'll tell you why, because I'm a firm believer in the Bible that I carry will be passed down to generations. And I have a, a hope that someday my grandkids will see my Bible and see the journey that the Lord took me on through his word. And so I encourage you, write in your Bible, underline things, highlight things, put things in the margin, stick things in it. I, I really encourage you to do that. But... Um, Thank goodness the Bible app can be anointed in Jesus' name. Uh, Matthew chapter 4. I want to talk to you tonight about the kingdom. I want to talk to you about the idea of the kingdom of heaven. And in 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 Matthew, uh, he refers to it most often as the kingdom of God. And in, uh, in Matthew, Matthew's gospel was written primarily to the Jewish people. I'm sorry, I got that backwards. In other Gospels, it's primarily referred to as the kingdom of God. In Matthew's Gospel, it's more referred to as the kingdom of heaven because he was speaking more to a Jewish crowd. His, his letter, his book was written to Jewish people, and it is, in their culture, disrespectful to refer to the name of God, so he called it the kingdom of heaven. Make no mistake about it, the kingdom of God that you read about in the other Gospels and the kingdom of heaven you read about in the Gospel of Matthew, they're one and the same, Okay? So don't be confused by that. There's not two kingdoms, and one's heaven and one's the kingdom of God. They're they're, they're one and the same. It's the kingdom. We'll just refer to it as the kingdom tonight. Amen? Amen. So I want to help clear some things up because I really feel like um, people misunderstand what the kingdom is all about and and what the kingdom means because in our minds, we we have this image. uh, Who's ever seen The Lion King? Has anybody seen The Lion King? You've got that great image of the sun you know, coming up, right? And you got Mufasa and his son Simba sitting next to him, and he says, everything the light touches is our kingdom, right? I can't do James Earl Jones very well, but, but you know, you've got that magical, that magical scene where everything the light touches. And, and we all grow up with this kind of mentality that the kingdom is, is physical, the fi- that the kingdom is location, and that, you know, we, we, we sense that the kingdom is a place, And so I want to help you understand that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God that we read about in the Gospels is not a place. Heaven is a place. We understand that. Heaven is a a realm. But the word kingdom literally means it's a shortened form of king's dominion. That's what kingdom is, king's dominion. And that dominion is the ruling place. But it's more than that. So let's read, and we're going to read through some verses a few times tonight as we unpack what what kingdom means. Amen? All right, so we're going to go into chapter 4, starting in verse 23. 23 through 25 is an excellent three-verse synopsis of the ministry of Jesus. Matthew sums it all up in these three verses, and then he starts in in chapter 5, kind of going into the details now of what these three verses talk about. So let's start, and I'm reading in the modern English version, but it says, Jesus went throughout all Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all sorts of diseases among the people. His fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were taken with various diseases and tormented with pain, those who were possessed with demons, those who had seizures, and those who had paralysis, and he healed them. Great crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Three verses really just encapsulates everything that Jesus did. But you'll see there what he preached. He said he, he, uh, he was teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And we're going to really focus on that tonight. Now, as you look at, you think about the kingdom, um, you know, there have been several empires. There have been, you know, you, you have the Babylonian Empire. You have the Persian Empire that was the first real big, you know, worldwide empire. Uh, you had the Greek Empire. You had uh, the Roman Empire. 
Um, and then after that, you had you know several empires. But but in terms of there was a time when they said the sun doesn't set upon the British Empire because Britain had territories around the world. That's not what this kingdom is referring to. Jesus wasn't referring preaching to a kingdom to come. Jesus wasn't referring to a kingdom as a place. He wasn't preaching the gospel, the good news of, hey, everyone, there's a plan to go to heaven. While that certainly was in the plan, Jesus was preaching something that was even better news, and that was the kingdom authority that comes with heaven. And so let's, let's unpack this just a little bit. First of all, that word that Jesus uses is a Greek word that means the authority and royal power. It means authority and royal power. It's, if you can think of it this way, it's, it's the authority that goes with you as a U.S. citizen when you go into other countries. Your rights are not surrendered as a U.S. citizen. They have embassies in other countries that you can go and, and step onto that ground, and that becomes U.S. territory. But you, as a U.S. citizen, still have the U.S. authority. You have to obey their laws, obviously, but you don't surrender your U.S. citizenship authority that comes with that. The, the royal family, the British royal family, when they visit around the world, they don't give up their British royal familyness. They don't give up their royalty or their lineage when they travel. That authority goes with them. And so the idea behind that is that it's not a physical place. If you look it up, it doesn't refer to a physical place. It refers more to, a, to an authority or, or, or royal power that goes with you. Okay? But as you unpack that word, the root word, the root of that word actually implies the way that somebody walks. The base word, the root word of that word is basileia, the, the, or basileia. The root of that word literally refers to the manner in which someone walks. It actually is describing their footsteps. And see, when you have royal authority, when you have royal power, you walk differently. And you begin to hold yourself differently when you understand the royal authority and the royal power that comes with being part of a kingdom. And that's what Jesus is referring to. He's referring to this royal authority that comes with the kingdom of heaven. In fact, he's, he unpacks that. He begins to say that to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 when Nicodemus says, how, do I, how, do, how does this all work? And he says, a man cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, the royal authority of heaven, unless he's born again. He has to be born of water physically and born of the spirit. Then he can enter into that royal authority of heaven. You see how that works? You can't, you can't enter into that royal authority. You can't become part of that kingdom authority until you become born again. So Jesus was laying that very basically. But so if we, if we, if we look at some of these verses, first of all, we have to understand that authority is permission. See, when I give somebody permission over me, I give them authority over me. And permission is usually found in agreement. I give them authority. I give them power over me when I agree, yes, you are the king of England, and I agree to, to, to recognize your royal throneship over me. See, now, as an American citizen, I don't look to the, the royal family as any kind of rulership over me. So if the royal family comes to my home and says, clean my shoes, I might do that as a host, but they don't command me. I don't recognize that. So the authority is permission. I give them permission to have authority over me, and that's through agreement. If I don't stand in agreement with somebody, they have no authority over me. Now, that doesn't mean that you can go, I don't recognize Trump. He's not my president. That's not what that means, okay? That's not what that means. By voting, by being a U.S. citizen, you've given permission for the process of selecting a president to rule over you. Does that make sense? Well, then I'm just not going to vote. doesn't work that way. If you don't want Trump to be your president, we all know what you do. You go to another country and submit to that country's rulership, and that you then agree to that authority. That's, that's how it works, okay? Sorry for all of you who are watching. That may have ruined some of you. But So agreement gives authority. Authority is permission. Permission is given. Are you with me so far? So let's read Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 4 again, verses 23 through 25. 
And let's take the word kingdom out and let's submit what it actually means in there. And let's read it this way. So Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the royal authority and healing all kinds of sickness and all sorts of diseases among the people. His fame went, out, went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were taken with various diseases and tormented with pain, those who were possessed with demons, those who had seizures, those who had paralysis, and he healed them. Great crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Why? Because he preached a royal authority. He preached about a royal authority that was available. That's the gospel, the royal authority. You don't believe me, in Acts chapter 1, he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will receive power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The ability to exercise that royal authority. So, let's look at Matthew chapter 6, uh, ch chapter six verse 10. This is a famous one. This is the, you know, the Lord's Prayer. But if you look at chapter 6, verse 10, Jesus says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We all know this. Many of us pray it, Lord, let your kingdom come. But what Jesus is saying here, it's the same word. When he was teaching in the phrase, he says, let your royal authority come. And by that royal authority, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, it's not the kingdom coming and supplanting itself or superimposing itself over the physical world. It's the royal authority by which we walk. Lord, let your royal authority come. And by that royal authority, let your will be done. Are you with me? Amen. Look at uh, chap uh, chapter 6, just a little bit further down in verse 33. We know this verse. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be given unto you. But seek first the royal authority of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. See, in every situation, we should seek the royal authority because royal authority has influence. Royal authority has influence over a situation. When you have authority, you have influence over a situation. Are you with me? Because I have authority over my children, I have influence over them. Royal authority gives you influence over every circumstance. Jesus exercised that royal authority and influenced every situation that came to him. Back in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23 through 25, it says, He healed all the diseases that were brought to him. Every disease. He healed them all. Why? Many of you will say, well, because he's Jesus. Well, he, yeah, he's Jesus. Of course he's Jesus. But in, in Philippians, it says he emptied himself of all that deity, and he took on the form of man. He took on that, he humbled himself, becoming like us. He, he emptied himself of that royal deity, and he took on the Holy Spirit, just like we have. He took on that royal authority and demonstrated what a life, what a human life what a man could do under the power and the royal authority of the Holy Spirit, who walks in that authority. See, Jesus never shied away from a situation. Jesus never walked into a situation. Hey. He never did that. Never walked into a situation. And the best part is Jesus never was presented with a situation that he didn't leave changed. He changed every situation he walked into. Even the towns that it said he couldn't do many miracles still said he did, some. He never left a situation the exact same way because he walked in royal authority, the same royal authority that Jesus said that we would do even greater miracles with. You see, Jesus, it, it, it sells us short to say, well, he was Jesus. But Jesus believed in you so much, he said you'd do greater things than he would. He believed in you that much. He believes in you more than you believe in yourself. Jesus. And he believed in you so much that he spent his entire ministry talking about this royal authority that you can walk in to affect every situation. Are you with me? Amen. So if you look at, look at uh, chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12. We're going to stay in Matthew for a little bit. Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. Verse 28, he's talking to the Pharisees. And he's talking about authority. But in 1228, he says, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the royal authority of God has come upon you. That's what he's saying. See, because the royal authority is greater than the kingdom that was currently in place, that, that demonic realm 
is no match for the royal authority that you walk in. You step into a situation with royal authority, situation changed. When you walk that way, when you walk with the understanding of the royal authority, you walk in. You understand that every step you take, kingdom authority, king's dominion goes with you. It doesn't have a boundary. Are you, okay? Good? You're all good? Okay. Some of you are looking at me like something broke. You're good? Okay. Okay. Slow down. Uh, look at Luke chapter 9. Uh, we're going to jump into Luke. Luke chapter 10. I'm going to use this to save my spot. Luke chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. This is really, really good. Luke chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. It says, Heal the sick who are there and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. The royal authority of God has come near to you and thereby has healed you. Heal the sick. Jesus didn't say, pray for the sick. He didn't say, hope that they'll get healed. He commanded us to heal. Now, there are two reasons why Jesus would command us to do something that we were, by ourselves, incapable of doing. See, Jesus, either he's a crazy person who loves to watch us fail, or he commanded us to do something that we are capable of doing in the royal authority that has been given to us. There's only, one re there's only really one, one of two reasons why you're not affecting a situation. Either you look at a situation and say, that's impossible, and it is for you as a person, but when I walk in royal authority, the kingdom of heaven, the Bible says nothing is impossible for those who believe. Nothing. You know what that word means in the Greek? Nothing. It means no thing. Zero is impossible there is no situation that is possible, impossible for those who believe. Jesus said that. Now, either, we, either he's a madman or we just don't believe it. Because authority is permission, and permission is given. And Jesus gave us authority. He's given us permission to walk in it. So that every situation that we look at as impossible is not impossible. When the royal authority that comes with it we know can change it. Amen? So it says, uh, it says, heal the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. The, the royal authority of God has come near to you. But when you enter a city and they do not receive you, go your way out into their streets and say, even the dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Yet be sure of this, that the royal authority of God has come near to you. So even when they don't receive it, Jesus is like, you were warned, the royal authority of God has come near to you. Not the person, not the place, the authority upon you has come near to you. Amen. So let's take it a level deeper. Let's unpack it just a little bit more. Let's go down a little bit more. How do you recognize the kingdom? See, if I go to Britain everywhere they go. You know that, you know that when, the, when the queen or the royal family, well, it's the queen, but when the, the ruling person is in the palace, wherever they go, there is a flag flown above that building. It seems really in, un, like, unsecure, like, you know, fly a flag. They're right here. They're in this building. You know, it seems like it'd be like the Secret Service nightmare, Right? There's a flag indicating they're in this building right here. But that's the idea, is that when the Queen of England goes into Buckingham Palace, the flag goes up. When she travels and goes into one of her other smaller palaces, right, the flag goes up. So how do you recognize the effect? How do you recognize the, the residual effect of a kingdom having affected a situation? How do you know? How do you know if the kingdom has come near? How do you know if you have changed and affected someone or something for the kingdom? Well, it's interesting you asked that question. I'm glad you did. If you look at Romans chapter 14, if you look at Romans chapter 14, Paul tells us how you can recognize the kingdom. In Romans chapter 14, verse 17, it says, For the kingdom of God, the royal authority of God, does not mean eating and drinking but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. See, when, 
when Henry VIII, you see all these great paintings of Henry VIII, right? There's a big old guy. He's, you, know, you see uh, comedic paintings of him. He's holding a turkey leg. You know, he's a big dude. Because kings eat well. Royalty eats well, right? If you've got royalty that's starving, it's a little off, right? Royalty is always known for eating well. Paul understood this. The kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking. You know that you're in the kingdom, not because you're well-fed and you've got no problems. The idea is that the righteousness, the peace, and the joy of the Holy Spirit is what the kingdom leaves behind. Do you understand? So let's unpack that. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 4. Let's read this again. Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 through 25. And let's see if the kingdom was left behind. Let's see if the residual effects of the kingdom was left behind. Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, and healing all kinds of sickness. Sounds pretty peaceful. Sounds like that would bring some joy. His fame went out through all of Syria, and they brought all the sick people to him who were taken with various diseases and tormented with pain, those who were possessed with demons, those who had seizures, and those who had paralysis, and he healed them. Great crowds followed him. Jesus left righteousness, peace, and joy wherever he went. I can't find, and I looked today, I can't find one story where people were really upset when Jesus healed them. And they were so angry that he healed them that he went around trying to find a way to murder him. No. See, Jesus even told John the Baptist, when John the Baptist's disciples inquired, are you the Christ? He says, go back and tell John that the blind see, the lame walk, and the poor have the good news preached to them. Righteousness, peace, and joy. Because when there's healing, whether it's emotional or physical, it brings righteousness, peace, and joy. When there are people that need an encounter with, with the Holy Spirit, an encounter with a Father who loves them, that's bringing righteousness into that situation. Jesus did it when he said that people were brought to him with demons. Matthew said people were brought to him with demons, and he gave them righteousness, and he gave them peace, and he gave them joy, because that's the royal authority of the kingdom brings righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So let's keep reading. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit come so that your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek first the righteousness, peace, and joy of the Holy Spirit. And his righteousness, it was so good he emphasized it twice. And all these things will be added unto you. See, that's something hard that we, as a parent, I'm going to just be honest with you. I'm going to be a little candid with you. As a parent, when I come up against tough situations, I, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shatter all of your hopes and dreams. I'm not a perfect father. I know. I'll let that sit for a second. Some of you are shocked. I'll give you a chance to leave. I'm not a perfect father. I've overreacted. I've reacted in anger. I've left situations worse than when they came to me because of my reaction. But I can tell you that when I finally understood that I should seek first his kingdom, that I seek now to try to bring righteousness, peace, and joy to that situation. And that's what Jesus was saying. In your finances, seek a way to bring the kingdom into your finances. Seek a way to bring righteousness, peace, and joy into your finances. In your marriage, seek a way to bring righteousness, peace, and joy into your marriage. In your school, in your work, in your neighborhood. Find a way in every circumstance of your life. Seek righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. How can I affect that situation and leave it with righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit? That's when we bring the kingdom. That's what Jesus was saying. Let that come and let your will be done. When we get to heaven, when we are in eternity, you can bet absolutely put money down on there will be righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit when we come into eternity. That's the kingdom of God. There was a song about it. 
Okay? Ron Cannoli wrote it. Some of you are like, I have no idea who that is. Amen. All right. That's why there's YouTube. So, Matthew 6.33, seek first that righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, and all these things will be added to you. When we react to try to bring that into our circumstance, it changes the way we look at things. How do I bring righteousness, peace, and joy into this? If you look at 12.28, Matthew 12.28, he says, do not fear those who kill. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not 12, that's 10. Let's keep going. Some of you got really confused there for a second. It says, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the righteousness, peace, and joy of God has come upon you. That's pretty clear, isn't it? If you have a demon and that gets cast out of you, guess what you're left with? Righteousness, peace, and joy. Amen? Amen. Uh, and then if you jump down to Luke, one more time, jump to Luke. Chapter 10. Verses 9 through 11. Heal the sick who are there and say to them, the righteousness, peace, and joy of God has come near to you. But when you enter a city and they do not receive you, go your way. Go out into their streets and say, even the dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Yet be sure of this, that the righteousness, peace, and joy of God has come near to you. The kingdom, the kingdom of God is, is, is not a physical location. So I wanted, I wanted to just share that word with you. It's so important. It's changed the way I walk. When I understand, you know, Alicia one time, she described, she described me as, as having um, limb-growing faith. She said I had limb-growing faith. Listen. I just, I just want to see anyone and everyone healed. And I got deprogrammed a long time ago. The first time I saw somebody miraculously, miraculously healed, I got deprogrammed. And something scrambled. There, there became a, a, some kind of processing chip up here that got corrupted. And I, there's not a situation that I look at where I can't see that God can't. I look at every situation, and my first thought is, God can do that. I, I'm not going to heal that person, but I can certainly put my hands on them. God can do anything. And when he says to me that anything is possible for those who believe, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the, and the prayer of faith, a righteous, effectual prayer, right, accomplishes much, listen, it doesn't take, it's not about having strong faith. It's just about saying God is God. He can do anything, and if you can use me, amen, let's do it, because I don't get the glory anyway, amen? So I want to encourage you to walk in that righteous, royal authority to bring the kingdom of heaven into every situation in your life. That kingdom, when we pray, let that kingdom come, and Lord, let it be done through me. Let me just partner with you. If, if you. if you would see me as worthy to be partnered with, man, let me witness that. You know? Like a, like a little child who wants to edge up front and be in front to see the magician, to see, to see it all just happen right there. Man, I, wanna, I want the front lines. I want to be on the front lines. Amen? Amen. Would you close your eyes? Let's close in prayer. Amen.